Hey, this is Max with LockMeDown.com, security for the everyday developer, bringing you another bite-sized security cast. Today, we're going to be talking about the specific security controls that Microsoft Azure provides for its popular storage services. See, Blob, Table, and Q storage services are among Azure's most popular services where you can host a wide range of data in different ways. I'm going to be assuming you're familiar with working with Azure and these services, and I'll be utilizing the .NET Storage Client Library to demonstrate how you can lock your data down in Azure Storage Services. Shared Access Signatures are Azure's out-of-the-box security controls that can provide you the ability to specify how, when, and what data access a consumer can have of your data. Microsoft has basically come up with a solution that works the same across all these related storage services. And once you know how to harness shared access signatures for one service, well, you know how to utilize shared access signatures for the other storage services as well. See, Azure Storage Services sit behind a REST API. So if we know the absolute URL to a resource in a storage service, and that resource has not been locked down, then we can access that resource by going directly to it through its URL. So in this example, we have a image, storage-security.jpg, being stored in the blob storage service, and we can access and have that image returned to us by using its direct absolute URL. There's no restrictions on this image, so it's returned to us. On the other hand, if we take a URL to a blob sitting in a private container, automatically making all blobs within that container private, and attempt to acquire that file, we'll find that we are presented with the following 404 not found error. However, when it comes to data accessibility, it's not always a black or white scenario where we either want to completely lock our data down or we want to make it completely publicly available. So what can we do about providing a consumer access to our resource? Well, this is exactly where shared access signatures come in. So the million dollar question is, what are shared access signatures? Well, simply put, they're just a set of query string parameters that when tagged onto a URL, they are made part of the HTTPS request and grant the retainer of that shared access signature some level of access to the resource. So take an image here in this case that is private as it sits in a private container. If we attempt to acquire the resource at that URL, we're presented with a resource not found or a 404 error. But if we tag on a legitimate and valid shared access signature to this URL and attempt to get that same resource again, we can see that we can acquire it. You got to remember that the storage services themselves sit behind a REST API that I mentioned before. So the HTTPS request that we make that has a valid shared access signature will grant some level of rights. So without wasting any time, let's just take a quick peek at what parts make up a shared access signature. The shared access signature is really made up of two parts. At the heart is the shared access policy. These are all the parameters of our query stream that specifically denotes the how, when, and what access is being granted for the resource. The second part is the signature, denoted in the name of the security control, shared access signature. This signature is a hash of all the other query string parameters that make up the policy. More precisely, it's an HMAC SHA-256 hash, and this is how Azure Storage Service can validate the authenticity of the permissions and verify whether or not any of the policy parameters were tampered or changed. As mentioned at the beginning, we can utilize the Azure Storage Client Library to generate the query string, which also includes the signature. We'll start with the Blob Storage Service for our example and show how we can generate a shared access signature for a resource, or in this case, a blob, that we can hand off to a consumer of that resource. Therefore, to be concise with these examples, imagine if you will, you have a method that will simply take a container or blob name that you can work against. We start with the heart of our shared access signature by generating a policy in the form of a shared access blob policy and specify what permissions we want to grant. In regards to a blob resource, we can specify how the resource will be able to be accessed by specifying the permissions the policy will provide, such as read, list, delete, write. We can use a bitwise or operation to add additional permissions as well. We can then include when we want the policy to actually go in effect, whether that's five minutes from now, tomorrow, or two days. However, because of how out of sync clocks can get from users in different locations, it's generally good practice to try to avoid specifying a start time.
Finally, we can go ahead and specify a time when the access will actually expire, whether that's one minute, tomorrow, or next week. With the policy created, we can go ahead and get a reference to our container. From the container, we can get a reference to the blob, which is the resource or the target for the shared access signature that we are creating. Once we have that blob reference, we can then request that query string shared access signature from the blob itself by calling get shared access signature. With that query string, we can concatenate it with the blob's URI and actually generate the entire absolute URL for that resource. Now there's a problem with this scenario specifically on how we created our policy that might not be so obvious. So let me take a quick moment to point this out. When we generate a policy in this fashion, it's called an ad hoc policy. We are generating that policy on the fly. When Azure receives a request for a shared access signature, that includes an ad hoc policy, the problem arises in how Azure generates the signature portion of the shared access signature. The problem is specific to what key Azure uses in the hashing algorithm that generates the signature. See, when Azure receives a request for a shared access signature that includes an ad hoc policy, it utilizes the main storage primary account key as the key in the hashing algorithm that it uses for generating the signature part of the shared access signature. Now this might not seem like much of a big deal until you realize you need to revoke that shared access signature that you've provided to some consumer. The only way to do that would be to generate a brand new storage primary account key and effectively breaking any application or use of that current storage primary account key. So the answer to this dilemma is that in place of the ad hoc policy, we use what's called a stored policy. This is a pre-generated policy that is stored on the server. When we make a request to Azure, instead of providing an ad hoc policy, we provide an identifier to an already existing server-side policy. In return, Azure will use a key that is associated to that policy as part of the hashing algorithm. When we need to revoke a shared access signature provided to a consumer that was created by a stored policy, we only need to either change or remove that policy that the shared access signature was generated from. So let's see how we can do that utilizing the .NET client library. Now I'm not advocating the creation and storage of stored policies and the request for shared access signatures occurring all within the same method. But for simplicity of this demonstration, that's exactly what I've done. We'll start off by getting a reference to the container that we want to save the stored access policy on. From here, we can get the current permissions for that container. It's from this permissions object that we actually can add a new stored access policy to the container. We'll start off by defining an identifier for this stored access policy we are creating, in this case, blob policy one, and creating a new shared access blob policy object. We'll define the permissions for this policy as well as when this policy will expire. So at this point, we want to update the container's permissions by calling set permissions and providing it the updated permissions object. Then we'll want to get a reference to the blob that we actually care for generating a shared access signature for. Once we have that blob reference, we can call get shared access signature off of that blob object. And instead of providing it a policy object, we'll just provide it the identifier to our new policy. Then we can concatenate that blob's URI and the shared access signature that we generated in order to have a full URL with a shared access signature included. By requesting a shared access signature from Azure that includes an identifier to a stored policy, Azure will then look to the policy details that's stored on the server for generating that shared access signature. So, so far we've taken a look at how to utilize shared access signatures for Azure's blob storage service, but a demonstration of Azure's storage security control would not be complete if I didn't show you how to utilize it 
for both the table and queue storage services as well. So let's take a look at that now. We'll start off by generating a shared access signature for a table utilizing an ad hoc policy. A lot of this is going to look very familiar with the exception of the objects that we use and the permissions that we set. We'll start off by defining our ad hoc policy in the form of a shared access table policy object. Off of this object, we can define what permissions we want to grant. These permissions will be unique to table storage where we can add, delete, query, update. We can also use the bitwise or operation to add additional permissions. We'll then define when we want this policy to start in the future, say one hour from now. We'll then also specify when we want this policy to expire, say in eight hours. We'll then get a reference to the table storage table that we want to generate a shared access signature for. It's from this table reference that we can generate our shared access signature by calling get shared access signature and passing in the policy. But in addition to the policy, we'll specify some other parameters such as the starting primary key, the starting row key, the end primary key, and the end row key as well. With the shared access signature query string in hand, we can then concatenate that with the table's URI. We'll then have an absolute URL to that table resource that includes the shared access signature query string as well. Creating a shared access signature for a table utilizing a stored policy is almost identical to how we did it in our blob storage example. We'll start off by getting a reference to a table that we want to save the stored access policy on. From there, we'll get the most current permissions for that table. And it's from this permissions object that we can actually add a new stored access policy by first coming up with an identifier, in this case, table policy one, and associating a new shared access table policy object with that identifier. We'll set the permissions for this policy that we want to grant, and we'll also specify an end time of when this policy will expire, say eight hours from now. We'll update the table's permissions by calling set permissions. Then we'll be able to request the shared access signature by calling get shared access signature from the table, but instead of passing in a policy, we'll pass in the identifier we created, table policy one, as well as the additional parameters as we did in the previous example. Once we have that shared access signature query in hand, we can then concatenate that with the table's URI. This will then generate an absolute URL to that table resource that includes the query string parameters. The consistency for Microsoft's storage security control should be apparent in the redundancy of how we create shared access signatures for the different storage services. And this will continue to be apparent when we create shared access signatures for queues. We'll create our shared access signature for a queue by creating an ad hoc policy as we have in the past, this time in the form of a shared access queue policy. We'll specify our permissions for this policy, which are also unique to a queue. They include permissions such as add, process message, read, update. We can then specify when we want this policy to start in the future. Maybe we'll set it to 20 hours in the future. We'll then specify an end time for this policy as well. Say one day from now. At this point, we'll get a reference to the queue that we actually want to create the shared access signature for. With that queue reference in hand, we then can proceed to request a shared access signature by calling get shared access signature from that queue reference and passing in the ad hoc policy we just created. And finally, we'll generate a URL that includes the shared access signatures query string parameters by concatenating it with the queue's URI. We can then provide this to any consumer we want to have access to this queue resource. So let's bring this demonstration to a close by looking at how we can generate a shared access signature for a queue utilizing a stored shared access policy.
as we've done in the past, we'll first start off by saving a stored access policy on the resource that we care about. In this case, it's a queue, so we'll get a reference to the queue. From the queue, we can get the most current permissions. And with that permissions object in hand, we can actually add a new shared access signature policy by first specifying an identifier, in this case, queue policy one, and then associating a new shared access queue policy object. So with our new queue policy object, we can go about specifying what permissions we want to grant for this policy. We can also use the bitwise or operation to add additional permissions, which include permissions such as add, process message, read, update. We'll wrap up this policy by specifying an expiration date in the future, say one day from now. With the policy created, we'll go ahead and save that on the queue by calling set permissions and updating the permissions. Then we can go ahead and request our shared access signature by calling get shared access signature from off the queue, but not providing it a policy and instead providing it the identifier we created for our stored policy. And finally, we're able to generate a URL for this queue resource by concatenate the queue's URI and the shared access signature query string parameters that we just retrieved. So hopefully you have a good sense on how to utilize Azure's security control for its storage services, and you can go put it to good use. This is Max with LockMeDown.com with another security cast. Don't forget to subscribe or get in contact with me at LockMeDown.com.